Thanks everyone for joining and welcome back to uh, Triple GovCon Day 2. I'm going to go through this really fast and we're a little bit uh, late. My name is John, I'm a board member for Triple for God. Um, and I'm just going to do a couple announcements real quick. One, thank you to all the sponsors for making this event possible. Uh, without this, we wouldn't be able to host events like this. Uh, and also thank you for all the volunteers. Those of you that don't know, Triple for God is a 100% uh, volunteer organization. Um, and uh, it's pretty amazing that they put on an event like this without any one being paid to do that. Uh, not many organizations do that, and I think the community, uh, it, it really speaks to one of the community. Uh, we also have the roles for board positions and other positions within the uh, Triple for God. So if you're interested in volunteering, please do. Um, wi Fi, you're going to have like 10 seconds to take a picture if you need it, otherwise, you can sign. Uh, right behind the drop times booth that has the info um, if you need it. So definitely check that out. All right. Uh, there's an app and mobile session for Session Eyes. Uh, you can go there and set your schedules. Uh, there's a QR code here, but again, uh, you probably not going to click it. I'm going to go too fast. Coffee is available directly after this in the garden. Uh, so if you would like to get some lunch, go out there. If you uh, your agency doesn't allow you to pay, uh, have free lunch, then the student union is about a five minute walk. Uh, more information in the email that was sent this morning. And social events. Uh, Blacks and Drupal happened this morning, uh, so that already happened. There's a dance off competition at 2, and there's a rubber ducky race at 2.45. Stop by the booth to check that out uh, for more information. And then later tonight, Pam is hosting a happy hour. Check out their booth if you haven't signed up yet. They've got a QR code for it. Um, uh, it's bowling. So it's going to be a lot of fun. Alright, so now I'm going to introduce Martin from Aqua to come up and introduce the keynote. Um, let's do it. Thanks. So, uh, why don't we start by getting... Yeah. I also want to say a huge thank you to everyone who was able to join us at last night's party. It was great to you know reconnect with all the people that traveled, in some cases uh, quite far, to, to be a part of this amazing event. Um, at Acme, we're incredibly thankful for all the support that we get from our customers, particularly in the public sector. And I'm sure that being the only Drupal hosting platforms as a service with Fed Rent compliance has more than a little to do with that. So I had to get this on um, they do say that the only constant is change, and in 2024, it feels like we're all dealing with more change than ever. To understand how we can cope with and even thrive in uh, times of change, let's introduce Tom Spire, Director of uh, Business Application Services Directorate at the Department of Labor. Leadership in a changing environment with the topic we're going to 
Mississippi. As you know, the federal government, and life for that matter, is in constant change. We are always changing. In fact, if it were not for change, I would tell you that none of you would have jobs. None of you would be contributing to the Drupal environment, to the Drupal community, because it's the fact that you all see opportunity for new things and difference that you're capable of adding value. And we're really talking about adding value. I love it. We got more people for the party. Let's go. Let's go. All right. So, leadership. If you're going to ask me to define it, I'm going to tell you to look at people that you might consider the most prolific leaders. Often they're not people that are managers, and there's a reason for that. So I'm not going to dare say that I'm the most prolific leader of those that you have the opportunity to meet in your lives. But I will tell you that there's a distinct difference between someone who is managing something, no disrespect to any project managers or managers here, and people who are actually leading teams of people to accomplish big and new ideas. Subtle difference, but impactful difference. Managers are very task-oriented and task-driven. You know this. It's like I gotta accomplish a thing by a day, I gotta stay within budget, I gotta stay within my goals. Leaders aren't usually talking about money. They're not usually talking about task-driven things, even though it matters. Instead, leaders are usually talking about things in their imagination. And from that perspective, I would ask you to take a moment, maybe 10 to 15 seconds, and I actually want you to participate in this room because I'm curious. Which of you in this room have ever had a vision and you took some action that made your vision come true? Whatever that vision is, raise your hand for you. All right, now of that thing, how many of you all, with your hands raised, did those activities through the work of other people, not through your own gut and will? Right there, you have two key attributes that demonstrate that you have some leadership potential or some leadership characteristic. Because lots of us in the room might be talented individuals, sit in the corner, write code, throw the best I can and then no one comes. Why? You did it on your own, it's great. But maybe you missed some piece that allowed you to connect with the people that you built this thing for. Um, so, leadership typically has several traits. One of the most prolific traits, in my opinion, is the ability to connect with people. Any leader you can think of, I don't care if it's going to be a political leader for those on the right or the left, those leaders are connecting with their constituent groups. I don't care if it's a religious leader, those people are connecting through their religion to inspire people to do different things that aren't just written in a book. For example, um, it's easy to go to Martin Luther King Jr. So I will not go to him, instead I will go to who he was inspired by, which would be Gandhi, and say that for Gandhi, he recognized I'm going to paraphrase this, and it's not a perfect paraphrase, but he recognized that change is inevitable. And through change, you are constantly improving yourself. And if you are not changing, you're effectively doing the reverse of change, which implies you're dying. So the goal is to welcome change so that we can constantly improve. Because you are in the Drupal Gov community, I have to believe that you all know all these scrum principles and agile methodologies that tell us continuous improvement, constant iteration, daily stand-ups, and the list goes on. And why do we do those things? Those are tactics to accomplish a visionary goal or objective. And those are the things about leadership that I would argue in the Smith School of Business here would tell you we study leaders from the perspective of being capable of seeing those talents and traits that are within inherent leaders who look like they're doing them, these things because they just were born to lead people. But instead, we can still emulate some of those characteristics to help 
akkor is arra a témben, mint én is a leadership képviselőkkel, a legnagyobb organizációk. So let's start with the first. Leaders have to lead people. You're not just leading yourself. And to lead people, that means that the first is one of the most critical components to uh, your leadership journey. I don't care if it's the intern, I don't care if it's the uh, team members that you peer with, I don't care if it's those uh, constituents or consumers who buy your product, they're all part of your team. But your ability to understand their pain points, what makes, what motivates them, what makes them want to engage with you, and to perfect that engagement leads to your ability to become a better leader. And I would also encourage each of you to consider yourselves leaders in your own right again, even if you're not in a quote management capacity. There are lots of times another question for the audience. Let's say you're not in the supervisory capacity. How many of you had an idea, put the idea on the table, and influenced other people to make it happen? Raise your hand for me if you are not. So again, that's another set of leadership traits and challenges. The boss is not the leader. I don't want to repeat that because some might think that DOL and so I, again, I'm from the Department of Labor, just in case you So some might think that because you're titled the boss or because you're titled with some elevated privilege that you make or should make every decision. I would highly encourage all of you in this room who either consider yourselves leaders or not to not fall into that fallacy of belief. I would tell you that the best leaders surround themselves again with the people that bring ideas and they weigh the ideas. And then they have to choose something, right? So you hopefully influence them to go with the idea that you had. And when you get to know, which a lot of people are going to get, myself included, on a daily basis. When you get to know, the question becomes, what do you do in the know? What do you do when you fill the gap? Leaders are gap fillers. So you might say, what does that mean? You have that vision we talked about at the start of this. You want to accomplish some big goal, whatever it might be. Back in the 50s, it was we're going to get to the moon. And everybody says that's impossible. Right? Well, guess what? The people who say it's impossible, they're not on my team. Not because I can't deal with naysayers, because they add a valuable piece to the puzzle, too. But for certain extreme challenges, you need people who minimally are not against the vision. Right? So we got to control the environment when we're talking about team creation, team building. If you can't possibly see the future that we're talking about, you will only hinder our opportunity to get there. Now, you don't have to be the leading edge person who just buys into every new sales pitch either, right? That might be the leader in the true assist, the person who has such a vision that they know it's possible, but they don't quite know how to get there. But because they don't know how to get there, this is what makes them seek the team members that join them once they communicate their vision for that future state. The leader's job is to communicate vision up and down the organization. The lowest graded employee, not lowest purposeful employee, the person who performs the most meaningful routine tasks is critical to that team. The person who has the most influential or respected tasks is influential to that team. But it's the leadership's job to bring those team members together. A great example I'll give you is this. I know right now there are some folks uh, on that space station, not the space station, who they can't get back like, from a Boeing mission or something. They're stuck up there longer than they should, so now they're adding more people to be back and resources to come back. Well, think about this. Imagine you happen to be the employee who works at NASA. And maybe you're on contract, or maybe you're actually a fed. I don't know how these services work. But imagine you're the person who helps clean up. So they're sweeping the floors, they're mopping the floors, and spills happen. You might say to yourself, oh, that's just the janitorial staff. They don't have value. Well, imagine that person 
astronauts to form. And the astronaut who's about to run into space walks by and slips and hurts their knee and ain't gonna fit. You just killed that person who dreamed of that story. As a result of either failing to communicate or that astronaut's inability to see that your work was taking place. Right? That's what I mean when I say every level of the organization matters for success. The person caring for you should be respected. The person doing ministerial tasks for you should be respected. The person both low and high in the organizational structure and dynamics should be respected because they have out, and it's a very specific value that they're adding that you might look over and tip the person. You'll often see in organizations where sometimes managers have a very draconian kind of task. We have to get this done, and must get done in this amount of time, and we fail to deliver something. We need to hold you accountable. And those things are true, but I would argue to anyone that the best leaders demonstrate their willingness to be held accountable to the team that they lead as much as they're willing or able to administer punishment for people failing to take tasks, goals, or objectives. So I will often tell people when I meet them the first time, so I should say it here as well, if you're ever seeking something from me as a team member, these are my flaws, right? So that you understand the way I operate, so that you understand what I perceive to be my strengths as much as my weaknesses. So if you're looking for something from me and you see see me on an email, and you didn't say, hey Thomas, we really need your response, I might have read it, and you're waiting for me, the big boss, to give you an answer to something. And I'm thinking you just want to get it up. And it's that miscommunication in that moment that's the failure. So another key attribute of leadership is the ability to communicate well, connect with all parts of the organization, the union members of communication. Now, as a senior executive um, within the federal government, I still want to call it a qualification of people from time to time. We evaluate the executive competencies, the so-called leadership traits that are required to ascend in, into the federal government. And there are five of them. They may sound familiar to you if you're in government. Even if you're not, but I would argue that they're out of them. Uh, leading people, leading change, results-driven, which I'm sure this organization is really big on. Everybody understands how to set a goal and try to accomplish the goal. So results-driven is likely happening significantly in this room. The next two are also just as important. Building coalitions and um, results-driven building coalitions and business acumen the last one, business acumen. The thought is in the federal government, so remember I was saying, there might be some people who perceive to be natural born leaders. They speak and people listen. And you question, how do they do it so easily? Um, what I would propose that research has exposed to people who choose to study leadership is that these five executive core competencies are likely touching upon those things that you can learn through process to make yourself at least show up with leadership competency. The fact that you show up with leadership competency, I would argue, does not automatically make you a leader, but you stand a chance to get results from your team members. You stand a chance to inspire people to do things. But I still think it really comes down, come in, come in. I, I still think it really comes down to how you connect with people. Um, if you were to ask me what I think is the most obvious thing or beneficial thing that for me has helped me to become successful is that I earnestly care about my team members at every level of the organization. And I think that's the number one thing. I know I sat in the conversation earlier today um, with the blacks in the rural community where they were discussing a few things. And one of the, the concepts that came up in that conversation was the question around kind of connecting with people and and trying to gain an opportunity to 
share an idea, share a value, and that sort of thing. And they put some ideas on the table. And my challenge is then to not perfectly plan. So what I mean by that is this. Sometimes we are the reason why we don't succeed. If I were to tell you, maybe if I put something on the table in this room and say, hey, it's an opportunity to win some big award or grant, but you gotta take some steps and be looking for this perfect project or process, there's a large population of the world or in this room by example that you might could say they need to go write the perfect plan, they need more time to polish that plan to a place where it's ready to be delivered for this type of review. And my experience has told me that sometimes perfect plan is to our detriment. Opportunity costs matter. And sometimes you miss an opportunity by not acting on any decision quickly enough with the information you have at hand, not perfect information. So, as a leader here, or project manager for that matter, um, you're constantly balancing your decision making against time, against clarity, and against the risk of failure. So I guess that's another hand-raising question. How many of you have actually failed big before? At some point. I am hoping that by the time we meet next year at Junior Webcom, I'm invited back to speak, that the entire hands of everyone in this room because what it tells me is that if you're not failing, dare I say you're not trying hard enough. So that doesn't mean that I want failure, right? <laughs> it doesn't mean that we're going to crash and burn and then we go out. But it does mean that you might be living in a safe space in You might be living in a space where you've gotten comfortable with whatever it is that you're doing and the knowledge that you're doing with being the expert in the group of common community, right? And knowing how to solve these challenges, but maybe somebody said to you, can you do more? You know, come on, man. You know, come on. Some sort of role, and you say, oh, no, I'm not good here. I'm just going to sit and do my thing right away. Um, I would encourage you, yes, come in. I would encourage you to push the envelope around your feet. Often leaders are people who are not risk averse, or not overly risk averse. They balance walking into their fear because the opportunities of fear are what create opportunities for change. So I'm gonna tell you right now in the Department of Labor, there's a lot of craziness going on in my opinion. This is not an assessment of labor, but it's just indicative of change. As you all know, the president, um, past president rather, had an assassination attempt in his life. That's not We had the current president step down from his nomination. That raises a lot of eyebrows, which puts uncertainty in the government's face, right? Then you have leadership changes. Just this week, press announced that the CIO of the Department of Labor is um, moving on to do other things. He's leaving government. He, at least the idea is that this way at the moment. Um, so with that change, there's a lot of uncertainty in staff. Staff members are hoping he's leaving. Who else is next? What's going to happen? Is my job safe? Is something wrong? Is he going to We don't know. And people start to create these ideas about how they see the future world based on the fact that some level of comfort that they have has changed. I would tell you those are the opportunities for extreme change to emerge when you feel uncomfortable. Because you're able to step in the gap and fill some role or some, some objective or some value proposition that if you're a contractor, that's where you make all your money. Your money is made in the gap. Hey, I see a problem you don't even know exists. Let me pitch to you how my company solves this problem challenge, right? 
if you're a federal employee, hey, I see something that's important that's not getting done, but it should be done for these reasons. Can I fill that space? Can I fill that opportunity? Can I fill that gap? If you're in the, um, the nonprofit space, the nonprofit community, the same sort of thing, if a group of people benefit from the work you do, and you're able to identify the need such that you can deliver value. So in whatever work it is that you all are doing in your respective chairs, I would argue, you want to also always understand your value proposition. And you want to understand the full life cycle of that value stream. So not only hypothetically along with you the developer, but who do you serve through the work you do? How do they use it? Who do you get your inputs from? So you know who you're collecting information from, you know what, what you're doing to process your information, and then you know what happens on the far side of that. It matters because if you can't articulate that, your job is easily replaced by AI. <laughs> Let's be real, right? AI can replace all of us if it were not the human element or touch that it tries to replicate. So if it's just a task, AI can do it. But we don't just want tasks to be done. There's more than tasks. AI can give us ideas. AI can't sell you ideas. AI can't connect people through interpersonal relationships and communication. There's going to always be a space for human being in my opinion. But there's going to be a space for us. And in these times of economic change, we're going to have to absolutely figure out a new way of delivering services, either at a lower cost, but still create value, or at a cost where people are willing to pay for it because it's just so important. So how do we build resilience in an organization? Resilience is really about people's willingness to share their true self, the times when they make mistakes. How often do you go to work and tell somebody you messed up? Some people do it regularly. Some people are scared to do it. I can tell you that in the government, I'm going to have to speak generically for government, what I've seen is that people who can do it in a way, it being sharing where they may have messed up they mess up, but it also leads to whatever the ideas are that they're going to use to not make that mistake again. Those are the people who usually thrive. What you see a lot is people who are scared to be fully honest about something that happened. And we do group calls and analysis and all this stuff, and it almost looks like a finger pointing to of uh, well, this happened first, I'm not sure that happened, and then this happened. And it makes you question with all the analysis, have you actually told me how something went happened? Right? People are scared for a reason. And people are scared when leaders don't create an environment that creates a level of, dare I say, comfort from the perspective of knowing that you can be your real self, knowing that you can be human and make a mistake, knowing that you can be accountable to a mistake, but also knowing that that mistake is not defined. Sometimes organizations have a bad habit of, I'm going to use Kristen because she's sitting in the front row, of saying something like, well, Kristen messed up, so, you know, she messed up that one time, we can't do that right now. And I'm going to lean into it because I actually try to encourage the opposite. She messed up. She's hungry for an opportunity to make herself. Right. That is not me. <laughs> and it's not her. She did it myself. I'm just using her because I know what she's going to do. But sometimes managers, and this is the difference between a management concept versus a leadership driven concept, leaders should be about building people up to accomplish their goal. So I always want to know. What do you want to accomplish when I'm a new manager over an organization? Not what do I want you to accomplish. We can talk about that after I get to know what you care about. But once 
something where, where it moves you. The things that move you are different from your other team members. It's the fact that you're different that when you put those different puzzle pieces together, you actually create more value than if you are all in the So you know, I'm not today, clearly you see I'm an African American man sitting here. Um, there's a lot of talk about DEI and things, stuff like that. That's really the essence of what DEI is supposed to be about, is that I can respect the whole person. It's not about your color, it's not about your gender, it's not about your sexuality. It's the fact that when you show up, you are showing up with yourself, and you are able to bring a perspective that's different, that adds value to the collective of the team. And it's that difference that makes us deliver a better product, right? whatever that may be, if you're selling some product or service or whatever. So, inspiration matters. Inspiring others matters. And I don't know that I have the answer to how to inspire, but I'm going to tell you is that I know that I tend to set a vision for the organization. Usually that vision is going to be something relatively big, but I've, I've been tampered back in my operational space. But the goal is to say, we want to accomplish some big goal that we might not hit quickly. But we all can agree that this big goal is the goal we want to meet. And that goal could be something like, let's say we're talking about the people who have come here. We want to grow the size of the people who have come by X. And I ask that you 50% groups. We want to ensure we have double the size of participants at the event. Sorry. Well, wherever GovCon is going to be next year. Is it here? All right. We're going to double the size here next year. All right. Throw this number out. And people might say, ah, really? We're just volunteers. But you start with the vision. Because again, if you can see that it's possible, then you find ways to make it happen step by step. There's this concept um, that a few researchers talked about, um, Jim Coles and Barry Owners, the Leadership Challenge. And they have this kind of visual that they use where it discusses yourself. They, they use this analogy, so it's something to think for your having a dance competition later. They use this analogy that talks about where you are in the dance floor and the relationships that you have to other entities. And they talk about the difference when you're at the building level. So if I'm a member of the team in daily activity, at what point do you step back and step up to begin seeing the orchestration of work that's happening on the ground? How groups of people pull us together over here, that group of people is always together, this group of customers are always together. And when you step back, you start to see things differently from when you're in the work. And the thought is that you want to build relationships across those artificial boundaries of kind of self coalescing. Again, to bring those people together to solve some larger challenge. When it comes to our customers or our stakeholders or our constituents, whatever term we use, you always want to be mindful of setting clear goals and objectives and getting buy-in from all the parties around those goals and objectives. So it really goes back to how we communicate. And you know, don't, don't sign up for something you're not going to agree to, basically. But once we agree, if I have that customer buy-in, they should be my partner in achieving those goals and these roadblocks to lead themselves to the next thing. So, See if I'm leaving something out. Storytelling. I think I started this story, this is a better story. But I'm going to tell you that, just to tell you this out, at the Department of Labor, I've been a senior executive for approaching 40 years now. And there was a huge change that we undertook, maybe in 2018 19, that I was part of. So the department, we went through what's called an enterprise shared service consolidation. Uh, we had 26, 27 federated agencies within DOL that each had their own missions. And someone had the bright idea, not me, but some political leader says, shared services, we need to make this happen. And 
they started they bring in their consulting team. They start. I, I was the waiting hour. The, 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 I was the director of IT for the waiting hour division at the time. One of those 26 subcomponent agencies. I was their IT. And someone walks in and tells us, "We are going to consolidate all these IT teams." And we want to make one IT shop on the authority of the chief information officer. And I was just kind of like, okay. You know, like my attitude wasn't really bad about it. I had some peers, as did my peer group, like the leaders in the other subcomponent agencies. Oh, they're coming to take us over. Oh, they're coming to take our ideas. Oh, they don't do it as good as we do it. All the negative thoughts you can think in the change. So remember I was talking about leaning into the change and leaning into the gap. We're in meeting after meeting after meeting about change. And these meetings are going absolutely nowhere. Why? Because people are being asked to give up resources. They're being asked to give up their staff. In some cases, these staff are anywhere from 20 to 80 people, right? They're contractors or contracts, millions of dollars worth of contracts. And people's automatic thought is, there's no way you can do this first. And they start with what can't be done, not what can be done. And then they also roll to all the reasons why me relinquishing my control is going to make my processes fail. So like if I give you my people and resources, all my stuff will be done. So that's the premise that, that many people start with. So I'm going to be in and out. Uh, everybody's complaining in this meeting. And I'm not a very vocal person all the time, so that's one of the things that I need to work on. Speaking up a bit more in certain conversations. But I like to listen a lot. And all I kept hearing was, no, 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 blah, 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 no, 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 blah, blah, blah. That's how it sounded to me. But I had fallen into a conversation where I had to leave this, what I consider a critical meeting, I'm um, my from office. And before I left, I raised my hand, hey, can I get a word in here? And I challenged my peers, hey, you all tell me what can be done. So I you know, just think differently. Tell me what you might be able to do. How do you make it less painful? Don't think about like, how you're going to make it perfect. Tell me how you make it less painful. Because this is not happening. You have to do it. So make it, make it hurt less. Work with us to make it better. Work with us to improve it. Nobody said not to put your ideas on the table about, hey, those are the things that you have to address as tasks when you work through the process, right? So I say that and I don't know what it means. So I'm going to share that with you. I'm just thinking, I just said a kind of random comment in this meeting, and that's kind of the end of it. I was not called to act yet. And then around that time, Maybe a few days later, somebody called me from the front office and of the department, so the OSAP or the OSAP. And they said, oh, we really need your help on this project and nobody needs to help us. They're not giving us info, they're not helping us do it, they have to do it as a mandate, they have to do it, we have to do it, we have to do it. And I was a bit nervous about it, but I said, sure, why not? You know what's going to happen? Like I said, we have to make it hurt us. I want to be mindful of time, so I'm going to get it close to time. I can talk forever. That's <laughs> all I So, the short of it is, fast forward, I applied for the job that I thought I was the most capable and confident to have. Deputy Seattle. I was like, hey, I'm the Deputy Seattle labor. I'm going to get it. Yes! Did I? Right? <laughs> and I had a call from the Seattle almost like, so I interviewed on Friday. He emails me on a Sunday, I'm thinking, oh, he's emailing me, he wants to talk on Monday, I must have got this job, right? And it's like, oh, Thomas, no, no, I need your help, but this isn't about the job. We haven't made a decision on the job yet, but I need your help. You need my help, you need my help. Oh, shared services, da 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 I want you to leave. Okay, sure, no problem, what does that mean? My wife was pregnant at the time, delivering a kid in like a month. And he's like, I want you to come on detail and, and, and work with us and all And I thought, I was so ready to say no. Not because I didn't think I could do it, timing. This leads to the 
pointed out in mid when I was saying, don't create a problem that doesn't really present itself. So within my own name, right? The Secretary of Labor at the time had two young children, maybe two and three, very young. And, and my supervisor at the time, who was a member of the Senior Health Service, I asked her, like, you know, he's asking me to do this thing, right? So I get the letter, she got the big man, what am I supposed to do? This doesn't seem right, it just seems crazy. And she goes, Thomas, you can't say no to the CIO. Uh, they're gonna ruin your career if you say no to the CIO. It's kind of like what she was saying in my ear. I thought, okay, so I, I went with the first. I walked into the meeting and I just became what I would consider more authentic to him at that time. At that time, it was all to me. Oh, I'm sorry. I set myself up. It's time. That's the time. It's the time. I set myself up. I did it on the top of it. I told that story like this. I told him what I couldn't do. I told him what I could do. And I exposed myself to be vulnerable. And he said, don't worry about that. We got to be who you are first. And then from that day forward, it just became a different way of me looking at when you are capable of telling where your strengths and weaknesses are, so that your team members can help also build your team that can get around. So we were successful in integrating something like 26 of these software companies. There's still maybe 22. There's still three big challenges that are kind of came out there for different reasons. But it was one of those big goals where people said, well, you can't be done. And we just started chipping away at seats by seats. And by no stretch am I going to take credit for all that work. I was put in leadership position. But what I'm saying is people were willing to share what they thought was fair and knew that it was heard. And once it was heard, then you had an opportunity to act on it. Do some mechanism. Some action might be an issue. It might be years later, so now it might be in the transition to nothing was forgotten. The people who were part of that process felt that their concerns were heard as much as leadership being able to stand on, well, I'll say political leadership, would be very important. Political leadership would be able to stand on what they were wanting to accomplish at that time and go forward. So I apologize for the recorded audience. <laughs>